Madison, formerly our Deferent Secretary of State, who has very um, firm views on this, and no doubt we will hear about that later. Uh, perhaps on the other side of the fence, not always, he says in his blog, uh, but Mark Avery, a former Conservation Director of the RSPB, and we look forward to hearing his views. Philip Merrick, those of you who may know him from the CLA, an estate owner down in Kent, he owns one of the two private nature reserves in this country, and is very proud of what they've managed to achieve there. And, and he is possibly the archetypal answer about how a landowner can look after and manage wildlife and produce a business. And then finally, at the far end, many of you will know the chairman of the Game Wildlife Conservation, Conservation Trust, Ian Coggill. Uh, Ian has been around a long time. Obviously, the Game Conservancy have a fantastic example of biodiversity management and wildlife control on their research farm in Loddington, uh, and so he speaks from a position of great strength. Without any further ado then, what I'm going to ask them to do is give you five minutes on their initial thoughts on this topic. It is five minutes only, and I will guillotine them at the end of five minutes, because I know you will want to ask questions. And so without further ado, Owen, some initial thoughts on the subject. Uh, Tim, thank you very much for inviting me to speak. I will be brief. If you want to come in at the back and spread around what you might like here. Better. Uh, very quickly, uh, when I uh, was at DEFRA, I set four key priorities. Uh, growing the rural economy, improving the environment, packing the green blob, not protecting it, improving it, and protecting the country from animal disease, protecting the country from plant disease. And this is stop, so I'll now chat for this one. So, if you... First thing is landowners creating wealth are absolutely fundamental. A good place to start is to look at a place that didn't have landowners. The most catastrophically damaged environments I ever saw were at the back end of the Soviet Union, not just in the Soviet itself. Take somewhere like Albania, where a completely idiotic communist dictator wrecked the economy. There was no wealth. And I remember seeing very clearly seeing brooks and rivers running black with oil. So it is absolutely fundamental to break the consensus, which went on for 20 years before I got to death row, that growing the economy and improving the environment are mutually exclusive. You cannot improve the environment if you don't have any cash. Someone has got to pay to keep up and keep down the predators. Someone's got to mend the stone walls. Someone's got to keep the water courses clear. And this was quite a major battle. So I was very, very keen to grow the rural economy. Not far from here is the town of Helmsley. I went there in the shooting season at about 6.30, 7 o'clock morning, it was absolutely buzzing with activity. Heaving with keepers and beaters, they were going in, buying their lunch, people going, getting things done early in the morning. That is down to the unique ability of the British to come up with a sport which attracts very large numbers of people, spending ludicrous sums of money, some of the most barren, bleak, unproductive land in the whole of Western Europe. And that is absolutely key. You would not have that activity. You would not have that wealth if you didn't have private landowners. So the two really do go together. And what it comes down to is management. We live in a managed environment. This isn't some Rousseauist wild wilderness run by the ideas of wind in the willows. You have to manage it. So as a classic example, look at water. The Somerset levels were drained, first of all by the monks of the Middle Ages, and then by Charles II, Charles I, Dutchman. Most of it's 20 feet below sea level. The so-called rivers are actually drained, they're artificial. Can you think of anything more credulously stupid than not to keep those drains clear? Waterways are what they're called, to get the water away. Are you surprised there were serious floods when after 20 years, when an ex head of the RSPB was head of the environment then, she said her, her policy was big mine on every pumping station, the result was an environmental catastrophe. There were no fish because there was no oxygen in the water. There were no predators for the fish. There were no voles. There were no, there were no, no owls. One of the old boys I worked with down there, been there for 80 years, he'd never seen so few duck, and there were no badgers. So you have to manage the water environment, you have to manage the land, and you have to manage species. And this, I think, we'll get on to. Philip has got the most brilliant place, which you'll tell us about in a minute, I went to in Sheppey Island. The dramatic contrast explained to me, which he probably can't do, I can explain it to you, by his keeper, who was working for a famous charity working to protect birds, getting absolutely nowhere, 
because the charity wouldn't let him remove predators, started working for Philip, who has got the most amazing barriers keeping out foxes to make salad of food look like a wet, wet paper bag. There's uh, traps to take out the stones, uh, keeper to take out the carrier, and the most dramatic increase in fledging of that ones. And it's the most classic, brilliant example. Gruesome place to go to, I thought. I thought Magwitch might come around the corner at any moment. But it's the most brilliant example of managing the environment and managing wildlife. The two get together. They won't go together unless there is... Because this ain't working. They will not go together unless there is private wealth. And there is a private determination to hand on a legacy to the next generation. And I do think this is vital. If you, the, the, the horrors of communism show that what Aristotle said, that which nobody owns, nobody cares for, that does not apply to private property. People have a real vested interest in growing their, their capital, growing their wealth, and growing the natural assets. And one of the things I did was encourage Dieter Helm the National Capital Committee to put value on natural assets. And I think that is something that we should be looking at and possibly discussing later, because I think there's real value in that. But my last word, and I think you're going to look at me in the five minutes, is the two are not exclusive. You've got to grow the economy and you've got to improve the environment, but you'll only do it by management. You've got to manage the waterways, you've got to manage the sea, you've got to manage the wildlife, and you've got to keep down the predators. And where you do, you will see an improved environment. I'll give you one last example, because I'm sure we're going to grouse, just about, not far from where I live, up on the Burwins. They used to shoot a lot of grouse. Now, where they're not shooting, the heather's got all woody and grey and nasty, they got ticks, it's bad for the sheep industry, and there's not much economic activity. There's a couple of estates have started really managing, they removed very large numbers of foxes, they are now bringing in visitors, there's a village with two very active pubs, at the end of a dead end. And that shows the balance. There's, above all, an increase in birds that nobody is actually trying to defend. There's an increase in curlews, an increase in ground nesting birds across the piece. And that is really important. The two go together. Thank you very much. been asked to talk about is very contentious really, is it? Because landowners are neither all friends nor all foes of wildlife. There are many types of landowners, there are many types of bird watchers, accountants and even politicians and some of them are rubbish and some of them are great and that applies to landowners too. Um, in terms of land ownership, um, in a previous existence when I worked for the RSPB, which was a long time ago, uh, we bought land, we bought land for nature reserves. Um, I remember we spent 10 million quid one year on buying land. And that's for the same reason that we all buy land, because owning land gives you more influence, more power to decide what happens on that piece of land. I think it would be great if there was more land that was owned by either nature conservation statutory agencies, such as Natural England, in England, or by nature conservation organisations like the Wildlife Trust, the RSPB, and there are others, because nature needs more help. Um, and one way of doing that is setting some land aside which, whose primary function is to deliver nature conservation. Where we are struggling in this country is where we are trying to do several things at once, which is always difficult, but that is the task ahead of us. Uh, so in the wider countryside, farmland birds, for example, the birds like skylarks and grey partridges and corn buntings, have declined dramatically. Now that isn't because landowners have shot them or tried to get rid of them, but it is because we have um, public policies which don't work to deliver what those birds and other wildlife needs. So there is what I mean, I, I would say the main thing that we need to do together, and DEFNA hasn't been very good at doing it, um, 
Mr. Patterson, I quite admire as a politician. I don't agree with him on many things, but he does strike me as the type of politician I would admire because he seems to say what he thinks and then tries to deliver it, which is what I wish there were more people in the Labour Party who were like that. But where DEFNA has failed over the last few years is that it hasn't made um, agri-environment schemes work for anyone, really. There aren't many farmers who say they work for them. The figures on wildlife show that they don't work for wildlife, and we are all paying for them. We are putting £3 billion a year into the farming economy. It's not money from the EU, it's not money from the government, well, that's where it comes from, but it's our money. So I am investing in land. You, some of you I know, you own it, but you're getting my money. You're getting the taxpayers' money as well. And I think the big challenge for all of us is to make that money work for wildlife, for landowners, and for taxpayers. And it's not working for any of them at the moment. So that would be the area where we ought to do better. schemes don't work. You know, well I do, I do agree because they certainly don't work because I think they're just not outcome focused enough. They, they really don't deliver. But we were told just to put a bit of background and then uh, bang on our own ideas. Sorry, I farm a long way from here on the Kent Marshes. Really, really fertile alluvial soils, so huge potential for farm production, but also at the same time huge, huge potential for wildlife. And in the late, late 1970s, I was a young man farming away pretty busily, and the whole of our 3,000 acres was designated an SSI, a site of special scientific interest. And for those who are old as me, we remember there was no appeal, no, no consultation over all that. And basically, that just meant. So you don't plow it, don't drain it, don't produce crops, leave it alone. And to me, the whole thing then seems entirely, seem then entirely negative. Because farmers are positive people. Um, and it just seems so after this, I read a pretty strong, or perhaps stroppy letter to the, as was then a predecessor to Natural England, English Nature or NCC, saying, look, if you're going to requisition the use of my land, I would rather manage it positively for a new objective as wildlife rather than negatively as the legislation provides. Anyway, that was ignored for because it was obviously quite a difficult letter to understand. But a, a year or two later, the Select Committee, the, sorry, the House of Commons All Party Environment Select Committee came down and have a look. So they travelled out of their Westminster committee rooms. They came down to Elvey, our, our um, estate in North Kent. And um, I just banged on to them the way I sort of did as a young man, very presumptuously. And uh, they quoted from this letter. And when their report came out uh, six months later, we had a rave review. And the first thing they quoted was this, if you're going to requisition the use of my land, I'd rather manage it positively for a new objective. Anyway, so it got the idea of positive management uh, into a thing, and, and, and the rest of history. We ended up with a national nature reserve, a national nature reserve, and, and uh, then two others as well. So my point is that landowners do need to be positive about conservation for management objectives. I think landowners and farmers, and I put them together, right, farmers and landowners, um, they need to be positive. And that, that to me is crucial, but at the same time conservationists, environmentalists need to understand that farmers and landowners own, manage and affect the land on which the huge majority of UK biodiversity resides. And so clearly both sides, and I don't call them mainly sides, we both need each other. There's no alternative. And, you know, for any future for wildlife, well, I, I think, you know, they have to be friends. There is no alternative. And I think the adversarial approach, oh, it great, makes great headlines and it, 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 it gets uh, interest, and, and, uh, but it actually doesn't achieve much. And at the end of the day, sorry, I shouldn't really say this to Owen, but politics bores me silly. Policy formulation and formacy, policy form you know, policy development interests me hugely, but politics itself, for me, is too adversarial. But of course, I realise practically you can't have one without the other. 
So to answer and in conclusion, there's no alternative to, but to be friends. sector for 42 years, so I know a bit about public land ownership, um, and I would advise you not to do it. Um, I wouldn't go quite as far as Owen, um, I mean, you don't need to go to Albania to see bad land management, um, but you do need to be very careful about the alternatives to private land ownership. Um, the one that's being touted at the moment is community ownership, for instance, and I'm always a bit shy about use the word community, it's used to make people feel good about bad things very often. Uh, as a local government officer I had to do a lot of community consultation and we were given money to go to local communities and talk about what in 10,000 pounds that could be spent in a ward on environmental improvements. We had meetings with people, the only ones that turn up are the ones that are interested, the rest of them don't turn up, so you've got a selected community. And I'm happy to say that the environmental improvement which came, and I'm not making this up, the environmental improvement which came at top of the list after our consultation was to chop down two plane trees in a road in Spark Brook. Um, and I asked why that was, and they said because it was interfering with the reception in the bookie's satellite dish. <laughs> <laughs> that's, not un that's not unreasonable. It might seem unreasonable to somebody who likes plane trees, but if that's your interest, don't be surprised. Um, the problem in this country with wildlife conservation is not landowners, it's not the NGOs. It's, what it is, is we've got 64 million people and growing in a small country. We can say it's bigger if you like, but lots of it haven't got anybody in it at all. And those 64 million people expect to consume as much of the Earth's resources in their lifetime as William the Conqueror's entire court. We are very greedy creatures. And the trick is, uh, Mark, right, you can buy places, I mean the, his strategy was to buy a honey pot, um, which had got lots of ducks and waders in it, uh, build a car park, put a, put a retail outlet on there, stick a cafe in, put some huts and let people turn up and spend money there, that's, that's great. The birds didn't notice the car park or the, or, or, the, or the retail outlet, and the bird watchers like to do it. That's fine, that's one way to do it. But if wildlife is going to do well in this country, its survival must be integrated in servicing the needs of the, of the population we've got. We have to find a way of, find, of putting wilderness with a small w into the, into the farm and managed environment. And that's what GWCT has been in the business of for the last 60 years. We try to find a way to build things in. Didn't, it's never perfect, but it is, it is absolutely vital to do it. Is, is, is land ownership perfect? No, of course it's not. Nothing's perfect in this world. Everything in human nature can be described as a bell curve. You've got a great big bell curve, but at this end of the bell curve is, are a few people that are doing fantastically well. At that end of the bell curve are a few people that are doing fantastically badly, and most of the population is in the middle. GWCT's strategy, and I'll suggest yours, if you're men and women of goodwill, is to push the bell curve that way. To make, it, over time, the average be as good as the best and the worst be as good as the average. That way we make improvement. Is private land ownership key to that? Of course it is. What are the advantages of private land ownership? Land ownership? First of all, you, you live on the place generally. So if you make a bloody mess, you have to look at it every morning when you get out in the morning. So you tend to think in the longer term. The old saying which I love is, live as though you'll die, die tomorrow, farm as though you'll live forever. And if you do that, that's the way you approach your land management, which is mostly the way people do. You're not going so far wrong. The second thing is that you spend your own money. I know Mark has mentioned before on his, on his blog about the three billion quid. It sounds a lot of money. I can tell you that the place I used to work for is 22 miles wide and 27 miles long. And before we collected the council tax, the government gave us three billion quid to run it. So don't think the countryside's getting a really big tranche of cash, because it's not. 
what goes into towns is vastly more than what goes in the countryside. We can argue about whether it works or not, and our view, due to a CT's view and certainly mine, is that everybody should focus more on outcomes. And I'm glad to say there's a movement in, the, in this government and the previous one to move towards outcomes. What people that own land do not need is somebody turning up in a, in a car they've never seen before and telling them what to do. Why can't we talk about what we jointly want to achieve? Why have you got to explain to me? A friend of mine who farms in Lancashire, the Lancashire coast, had a, has a, a brook course which, is, which silts up and he needed to clean it out. So somebody was sent along a couple of years ago to look at it and they came and stood on the sea wall and they stared at it. And they were there to get a decision as to whether it could be cleaned out or not. And they said to him, which way does it flow? <laughs> and he said, I'll give you a clue, the sea's over there. <laughs> So we don't need that sort of advice, but what we do need is people working together to achieve things. And the final advantage of a, of a, of a private landowner, well not the final one, another one, is that they can make sensitive decisions. Mark used to work for the RSP, and when we talked, the first time we ever met, uh, we talked about predator control. We I very kindly took me to Geltstow, and we had a presentation. At the end of the presentation, um, I, didn't, I, I didn't ask any questions, and they said, well, what about the questions? And I said, well, I haven't got them. Mark said, if you remember, what about predator control? And I said, it's your ground, mate. You can do what you like on it. I'm not bothered. And, um, and so he said, people like you always ask about predator control. I said, well, people from Birmingham ask about predator control. <laughs> that's, that's a real surprise. <laughs> so th there is... And, and it's understandable, if you're running a massive charity that has to raise £125 million pounds a year just to stay afloat, you would upset as few people as possible. If you're a private landowner and you want to kill stoats, you don't have to have a committee meeting, you don't have to, you just kill stoats. You know? So we can make sensitive decisions much quicker and more effectively than, than, than that. So my final message to you is please cherish what you've got. Please. <coughs> try to do what we should all do, and that is to improve on previous bets. Do not think that public ownership is better than private ownership, because when you look round it, it's all gone pear-shaped, but the people that gave you the advice, and the people that told you what to do, don't be surprised if they're not there. You will be. Thank you very much. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very grateful to all four panellists for giving that small expose. Uh, now, my job is to try and control this um, going forward, and uh, I will open the floor to questions in a moment. Uh, we've had one or two controversial statements there, which no doubt you'll wish to pick up on. I think NGOs should own more land. Um, uh, Agri-environment schemes don't work. Uh, we should think about working together for a common goal. Uh, all no doubt issues that you would wish to have a view on. Um, but please can we try and stick to the subject of wildlife being friends or foe uh, for land managers and the, uh, the job of actually trying to see whether the land managers are the best people to look after the wildlife stock of our country and should we do it together. And at that point, uh, if I can open it to the floor, if we can't hear you, there is a microphone over here on the left um, and over to you. With one on either side, please could you say exactly who you are uh, and answer your question. To start with, to the person you'd like to ask the question, but I don't want to give every question to Mark. <laughs> and at that point, um, I'll hand it over to you. Um, gentleman on the floor, can I come in a minute? So, to the panel, my name is Harry Lake I actually sit on the board of Natural Resources Wales. Um, it's very interesting to see, um, very interesting to see where Wales is going from the point of land management. And I will say, for those who don't know, the CLA and the GCWT have been fabulous on the Nature Fund in Wales, whereby two of us got together nine different landowners throughout Wales, the Barrens, Snowdonia, Black Mountains, to, to use five million out of the five million pot to do grass restoration and other projects. And that comes down to what we're calling in Wales now natural resource management, which to all of us landowners, we've been doing for hundreds and hundreds of years. And it seems to be a good political thing to say. 
but essentially it's the to coming together, which we've done at Natural Resources Wales, with the Environment Agency, Forestry Commission, and what was CCW, um, to make it integrated, which has allowed this to happen. Now to the panel, is it, I think, within probably three to five years of being worth looking at the results of this in Wales, because we've gone down the biodiversity route far more in farming than anybody else. But why hasn't, or would it be necessary to do that in England to get the outcomes that potentially we're going to be seeing in Wales very soon? I see uh, Murray Raymond, NFU president, is lurking in the background. Now he's pretty Welsh <laughs> with a name like that. Um, but I really don't know. My point is, I, I, I just can't. I, I, I'm sorry, I can't ask you, answer your question about that. I, I don't know. Yeah, of course. I, I was coming on to that. Integration is key, and out, uh, focusing on outcomes is key. And the more you can give farmers a land sense of ownership of the outcome and ownership of how you get there. I'm not at all in favour of this prescriptive approach because at the end of the day, farmers and landowners know their land, they know their farms, and if you say to them, this is what you want, and broadly within the thing, allow them to work out the best way of doing it, then they have a sense of ownership and a sense of delivery. If it's a tick box thing, that just say tick, 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 um, and you'll get the money, it won't work. And, and sadly, I, well, uh, sadly, I agree with Mark. <laughs> I agree with Mark, but sadly, that's a better way of putting it, agri-environment schemes in many cases haven't worked because firstly, they have very outcome friendly enough, and secondly, they haven't been scientifically driven enough. They've been too politically gentle. Yeah, I think in Natural Resources Wales has been a breath of fresh air. Um, my, my own view is, that, this is a personal view, that CCW wasn't its predecessor, it was, was far, far too prescriptive. Uh, and I happen to know one of the people who was involved in all this, and, and his experience is, is salutary, I think. His family had owned that hill for generations uh, since the Glorious Revolution. They'd been shooting grace on it for generations. And after the war, they decided that they would keep it as a grace mill, and um, which wasn't a, a, a money-making thing. There were never, you know, after the war, there weren't that many grace, but they could have a couple of days walked up, and that was all right. Government came to them and said, um, "We'll give you." Well, get many governments came and said, "We'll give you money to drain it," and they said, "No thanks, it's a grace mill." So then they came and said, give me money to put roads on it. They said, no thanks, it's grey small. Come and said, give me money to fence it. They said, no thanks, it's grey small. Give me money to put trees on it. No thanks, it's a grey small. No, it's still a grey small. Then CCW turned, turned up and told to stop burning the heather because it might alter the colour of the water. And then they stopped them. And then, but you can still graze it. But once the heather gets above a sheep's belly height, it can't get on there. So it turned into, and that was a place that had golden plover on it, curly on it, lapping on it. Grace on it, black grass on it. All gone. Hello, will you go here uh, and then we'll change the question. Um, Ian, sorry, Owen and then Mark. Uh, well, I, I touched on this very briefly when I was speaking, that uh, this is the classic example where private landowners have made a huge difference because we just had those, those grass moors ran down after the war. They, um, Philip's point of view, I'm, I live 50, my bottom gate's 50 yards from the Welsh border, so this is, this is pretty close to me. I look out on those hills. And, and not someone like Harry Williams Winter, he's absolutely fantastic. But there has been the most concerted blitz on the predators. Don't they underestimate what they've had to do to get going. And if they can get help from the Welsh Quango, I think that's great. Now, I hear they are negotiating, I haven't heard how far it's got. But the, the, the key thing is this was a determination by a young landowner to turn around what was a barren wilderness which had been left under the Russo principles to let it go hang and let everything happen. So what you had was scruffy, woody heather, a few carrions and a few magpies and not much else. And not very good country for the sheep. And he's completely turned that round. And if you look at the country, drive up the Kiriog Valley, up to Glenarmon, you can see the very clearly the well-managed areas and the less well-managed areas. And it comes down to private landowners managing the landscape and managing the wildlife. 
Um, well, I'll say a couple of things, one of which you might like and the other I'm pretty sure you won't like. Um, so the thing I'll say that you might like is that we seem to be agreeing that um, agri-environment schemes don't work that well. And uh, I've always thought CLA's position has been quite sensible, not always completely right, but quite sensible on agri-environment schemes. Uh, the reason that agri-environment agri schemes haven't worked as well as they should have done is not, it's kind of because, it's not because they haven't been science-driven, it could have been more science-driven, it is because they've been politically mucked about with. Um, I'm sorry, Moiru, but it's because the NFU have had too much say in what agri-environment schemes look like. Uh, so, what would have been some quite good agro-environment schemes have been watered down because of the might of the NFU and that's why we're not getting as good um, delivery from our three billion pounds as we would have done. So I'd rather the CLA had more say in them. I mean, I'd rather I were in charge of them, but I'd rather the CLA had more say in them. Uh, the thing you won't like so much, I don't know anything about Wales really, apart from the fact my mother was born there, and um, I have driven through some of those areas, and I don't quite recognise the descriptions that we've heard, I quite like to see the bird counts that back them up, but I did hear the word grey shooting, so I expect you want me to say something about that. Um, uh, I think we should ban it, so I've written a book which tells you why we should ban driven grey shooting. I think we should ban driven grey shooting because it's an unsustainable practice. It's a practice that delivers badly for uh, people in general, for the environment, and it's worth pitiful amounts to the economy. If you did the economics properly, it would be a net disbenefit to us all. Um, so it's quite a big subject. You could buy my book. Um, there's a hundred thousand words. I did write the book so that instead of having uh, sound bites with uh, uh, GWCT on farming today or a two minute knockabout at a debate at the CLA game fair, you could all buy it, take it away, and then hate it. But at least I've written down why I think uh, driven grey shooting is a bad idea, and you can have a look at it and you can tell me what you think afterwards. Thank you, Mark. I think we won't have any more sales pitch probably from at this stage. I'm sure there'll be many afterwards. Um, I'd like to come back to the subject of agri-environment scheme later because I think there'll be some people who would disagree with your uh, your tone, the two of you in the middle, um, as to how much benefit they've done for their estates. I've got a question here in the middle. Like that. Jim Dixon from The Times. Um, three generations ago, we would have been sat in this room and people would be completely surprised that there was even a debate about nature and farming. Three generations ago, there was no dispute. People thought that nature and farming were intrinsically uh, together. For the last two to three generations, there has been uh, a big debate and many farmers have got have found their way through that. What would the panel say would be the big issues for the next generation of land managers, bearing in mind the brilliant thing about private landowners and institutional landowners is they 